Hey everyone, welcome to Redefining HR Podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt, and I'm really excited to bring you this special episode. You know, for the last couple of seasons, I've really wanted to record an episode, a tandem episode with a CEO and a chief people officer together to talk about their working relationship, how they partner, and so much more. And this episode is exactly that. So I'm excited to be joined by Julia Hartz, CEO of Eventbrite, and David Hanrahan, Chief People Officer at Eventbrite. And so I'd love to just kind of open up with introductions. And Julia, I'll start with you. If you wouldn't mind just giving a brief introduction for the audience. And then David, you can do the same when Julia wraps up. Hi, I'm Julia Hartz. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Eventbrite. And I, I have spent the last uh, too many 15 years working on building uh, a great company and culture. And uh, beyond that, I have two daughters. Um, I am married to my co-founder and the previous CEO of Eventbrite. Um, and so we have a somewhat unique existence, but uh, it's pretty normal, normal to us. So I'm David Hanrahan, and I'm the Chief HR Officer, aka Chief People Officer, but I'm Chief HR Officer at Eventbrite, and I've been doing this work for um, about 20 years, the, the HR work. And um, you know, I've always been really attracted to progressive cultures, and so um, you know, I've been at Twitter, Zendesk, um, Niantic more recently, and, and Eventbrite in many ways is like the culmination of a career for me. Um, have followed Julia for a long time, and the, the culture that she's building here. Um, over many years, um, in in progressive and leading edge, you know, uh, you know, throughout the time I've been following them, so I'm um, incredibly honored to be here. And yeah, it's been it's been a dream to work with Julia. Yes, yeah, so I think you know the last uh, the the relationship between a chief people officer and a CEO has always been important, but I think the last several years specifically have just absolutely reinforced the importance of that the partnership, the relationship. The connection uh, we we as you know we the collective we as society the workforce certainly business has been through a lot uh, over the last two years and so many of these uh, monumental moments uh, have come down to how the CEO and the HR executive work together to guide the company through those situations and so what I'd love to start off with uh, is have each of you describe the other person and talk a little bit about your relationship from your perspective. And uh, Julia, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Well, it's been a few years that David and I have worked together, but actually when COVID happened and, you know, was, was we were at the tip of the spear as one of the most heavily impacted and immediately impacted companies uh, back in March 2020, we... Um, we were just kind of newly forming our relationship and and didn't know each other quite well. So there's not, I mean, there's a lot that I know about David now, and there's not nothing quite like a crisis to accelerate the getting to know you period. Um, so the way I would describe David is, I mean, he is truly a uh, the the guy you want in your corner during uh, massive chaos because he's unflappable. He has a, a grounded nature that um, allows him to, to take in all the information, rarely ever, if ever, getting overwhelmed by that. And then, you know, being really thoughtful about what to do with all of that and how to re-architect and build back up a company that was you know, really disrupted during such a uh, acute crisis. Um, you know, we we all there was a period of time where we all were told to go home and not gather, and very few businesses contemplate the very basis of their business going away overnight. So we were thrown into the eye of the storm together. Um, so I would I would describe David as as unflappable. I would describe him as as incredibly grounded, but then he also has this brilliance and irreverence that um, hits you when you least expect it. And what I love about David is that he's always game to um, ideate and and not iterate, but actually innovate and take pretty big, bold changes and steps to create something that's, you know, an order of magnitude better than it was. And so I, I think that, I think what, when I think back to like, what has really helped us succeed in building the next iteration of the Eventbrite culture and, and working through culture decisions is first principles thinking. 
And I think that's really strong in, in David. He starts usually with a blank sheet of paper in his head. And, um, and, you know, I think that is something that's very inspiring and motivating to a CEO because, um, you know, we're always thinking about how we can be bigger, better, you know, uh, more sharp, uh, critical thinkers and expansive. So I've, I've really enjoyed that, uh, about David. He also has a really witty personality. I mean, this is a love fest. Are we going to say what we don't like about each other as well? Oh, I'm going to get there next. Don't worry. Don't worry. This, this, <laughs> the show is all about balance. So, uh, uh, David, how about you? How would you, how would you describe Julia and your working relationship? So, you know, I think Julia, um, what, what you what you see from Julia right off the bat, you start working with her is Julia leads with compassion and, and trust and you got to earn trust. But and, and I, so I've heard of trust. I'm really fascinated by trust nowadays. I've, I've heard of trust described as like the only legal performance enhancing drug. And, and over the years, the partnership I felt with Julia is, is one of trusting. So I think that's kind of like the, the core description. And again, you got to build that. Um, but I think, you know, in my career, you know, 20 some odd years doing this, it's fleeting to feel as though that you have that on a consistent basis um, with your CEO. And, um, you know, CEOs have a lot on their mind and like you can you can quickly lose trust, um, but it's it's hard. And but Julia leads with compassion and trust. And I think um, it's a good ideal for any CEO, CPO pairing is to feel as though you have that trust because it can be fleeting. It can be really hard to find. I feel very comfortable talking to Julia, for example, just about moments when I think the exec team needs to step forward on owning a people topic versus it being an HR thing. And I, I trust Julia to also sanity check with me that like, yes, David, and here's where we need you. So I feel a trust from her. I feel like I can like be my authentic self. I can like put my ideas forward. I'm not going to be like, you know, sort of excoriated for, for doing so. Um, but Julia keeps me honest. And it helps me balance my head between the clouds where I admittedly stray too often, you know, down to the ground, you know, where we need to be at times. So compassion and trust is kind of what comes to mind for me. Yeah. And I think, I mean, all key importance and key ingredients, I think, in that relationship, um, particularly because you're not always going to agree. Uh, and I think that there are the dynamics of a healthy relationship uh, allows you both to push back on each other, um, you know, in a respectful way, but, but, you know, be able to kind of protect your, you from yourself. Sometimes you might, you know, get kind of blinders on towards an initiative and you might be overlooking something and the other person can help pull you back a bit. But, um, when was the last time you both disagreed and, and how did you kind of reconcile that in, in the end? Well, one thing comes to mind that's just, you could sort of, it's it's gotten to be such a large meme that that I but I can't not bring it up, which is the four day work week. Um, there was a story uh, that we can tell you if you're interested in Lars. Uh, but effectively, it the result of the story and this journey was that you know we we ended up deciding to institute a bright break. And um, I talked to David about the idea of you know what if we had one Friday a month where we all took a break, but you could, especially for the parents in the company, you could act like you were going to work, but really just like catch up, take a breath. You know, it wouldn't be a holiday, but it would be sort of an internal holiday where we all, you know, put down our keyboards and you could, you could go out and recharge. You could do something fun. I mean, whatever it's, we're all grownups, right? So let's all just like take a break, but we'll take it together. So it'll have greater impact. And um, and David heard heard me say, "Let's take every Friday as a bright break," <laughs> and and I think that's probably. I mean, it's not so much a disagreement as just a miscommunication. And so he went to the whole executive team and was like, "Okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, you know." And and I started to hear back from people about this, like, "Hey, are we gonna talk about this?" And it was. It took me a minute to realize. <laughs> To realize where the miscommunication happened, but then now that that has, while bright breaks have been tremendously successful, that has now become a meme. And um, you know, I think it's it's a place where maybe, uh, where maybe there's like part of me that knows that he has a good point, but I'm not yet ready to go there to like drive that amount of radical change. And um, he's very patient with me on that. Yeah. 
So I, like I was running with it. I'm like, oh, four day work week. Okay, great. Like, hold on. <laughs> and it's, you know, Julie will do this thing. Like, like dude, hold on. And, um, I'm, I get in my own head, you know, I'm kind of running, I'm racing. And so, yeah, I remember that, that moment. Um, now what came of that was something pretty cool. We, we ran it as a pilot. What would happen if we actually took the first Friday off, um, you know, each month, you know, during the latter part of the year, the pandemic, we assessed it. We asked people their, their opinion, managers and all employees. Um, and at the end of it, we had this conversation. So we, we kind of settled down We're like, all right, let's, let's just kind of do this for a few months. Uh, first Friday each month. And we found this amazing end result, which is managers at all levels, employees is incredibly helpful, not just for um, recharging, but for people to have a sense of productivity. Like I can dig out the whole company is doing this at the same time. Um, Now, another disagreement um, that I fomented was um, I remember that in the back of my head, I'm like, Hey, this is great. Let's, let's just, let's just blow this out. Let's blow this whole concept out. So we were at, a, at an offsite um, around a campfire and I was, I was having a few glasses of wine and, and our CFO was sitting next to me and we got on the concept of um, the five day, 40 hour work week. And I, you know, so I think it's, I think it's time to reimagine that. And he's like, okay, well, like, what's your idea? And I'm like, what if we worked um, five hours a day for only 40 weeks a year? And he's just like his face, just like, you know, like his frown. <laughs> Uh, and I, I, have, I have these moments with with our CFO where I'm like, I'm just about to lose the CFO. Oh, no, I'm losing the CFO. And I got like come back. Wait, hold on. Just time out. Like, just consider it for a moment. And Julia's kind of listening. She's like listening. She's like, I'm not going to interrupt what's going on here. I'm going to listen before I weigh in and let, you know, David and the CFO kind of hammer this one out. Um, but, you know, um, those moments happen. And uh, the way that that Julia um, manages those those conflicts is 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 really clever in terms of like letting greatness manifest from, you know, what could be like intellectual disagreements. Well, I think beyond it, 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 like if something is clearly unethical or immoral, it's, it's a really clear cut. Um, uh, so that, that I'm less open about (laughs) hearing those things through great ideas and off the wall ideas and different ways of working and creative ways that you can maybe change the way we work and the relationship with work and the relationship with each other. I just always tend to think that there are people out there, particularly, you know, people like David who have great ideas that haven't been launched into orbit because somebody wasn't brave enough. And so it's always in my head that, you know, even if it's a, a, you know, kind of laughable concept at first, those, you know, the people who get laughed at are always the ones who are making the greatest change in the world. So I, I always start from the, that first principle and then move on to you know, figure out, like, are we ready to take on that change? Are we ready to enact that or test that? And it's messy, you know, and sometimes I get impatient about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that especially in in this moment in time, and I say moment in time, it's not you know it's not a day, a week, and it's probably not a year, but this this period that we're in, where we're actually redefining work itself, right? We're moving away from industrial era constructs constructs of work and building something new. It's ripe for those kind of moonshots and and different ways of thinking. Uh, if there are not kind of barriers. Right, put in place, and it is something. Not everything is going to be feasible, um, but it's interesting. And I, and I applaud leaders like David who are really pushing the boundaries and saying, just like, well, what, what if, what, if, what if we tried to do something like this? And and I think it's a segue to my next question. You know, the interesting aspect of this conversation, I think your relationship is that you know, I know David uh, is going to be transitioning out of the organization, and you're both working closely together on a chief people officer search. Um, to, you know, fill David's very large shoes. And so, Julia, I'd love to start with you. Like, when you think about the ideal, you know, profile, persona, style, all of that um, for your next partner in this CPO role, what comes to mind? Well, I mean, I think it is one of the great, you know, partnerships for any any builder. Um, and certainly uh, in my position as, as founder CEO, it's something, you know, I think, like my North Star, what gets me out of bed, uh, what makes me feel lucky about how I'm spending this one, you know, wild and precious life is building a great company. And there's so much around that 
that is directly in the realm of this of this partnership. And so, um, you know, while I'm I'm tremendously sad to to see David move on, it's his it's his choice and his next chapter that he's running to, and I'm supporting him in that. Uh, and it's it is unique to have a kind of transition that oh novel idea it's incredibly functional <laughs> and I feel like <laughs> only with great trust can you do that because it's not easy but it but it actually for the organization and for the people involved it's actually a really ideal outcome when you get to imagine the future together and there's no kind of ego or bad feelings getting in the way like how unique is that so when I think about the the person who will you know who will fill uh, David's, I don't even know if he's he's wearing shoes these days, but if he is, his shoes, um, is someone who has the, the energy and fortitude to architect the future of this already great company moving and evolving into, into its next growth phase. Um, and the, you know, the energy and the wherewithal to like see it through, because this has been a really exhausting time for people in chief HR officer roles or chief people officer roles or any HR related role, frankly. So I think that, that, that kind of freshness will be good for us in that next chapter. Although David has endless energy, so this is not an indictment on, on him. Uh, but the, the second thing is that David did such a massive solid for me as a CEO. And um, before deciding to transition, he went and found a great set of leaders um, to, to report directly into this. this. And so our what we call Breitling Experience, which is our version of HR, our BX leaders are all senior, hungry, focused people. So I feel like that only just raises the bar for who I'm looking for, right? Because um, they're rearing to go. They're running the trains. And I feel like they deserve a great leader and a great strategist and visionary, but also somebody who, you know, who's been in their shoes, like who's who's seen HR from the ground up, who understands it through and through. And finally, I think the extra kind of... Um, I don't know, like the uniqueness of, of Eventbrite and the way that we operate is that there are nine executives who are on an e-staff and are equal owners of the strategic decision-making and investment decisions that we make as a company. And that's how I lead is, is with this collaborative, with shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder shared ownership. And so, you know, David's been a tremendous player in that sense. And so I am looking for a player to be elevated above just the HR function um, and well beyond into like what kind of decisions ranking five to 10 years down the line. Yeah. I mean, I think that that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think when you think about the kind of profile you're targeting, that's the level of responsibility that they're going to be hungry for. And the level of, you know, being able to work shoulder to shoulder with their executive peers as equals driving the strategy of the business. Um, and, and David, for you, I'm sure it's a somewhat unique position to be in when you're kind of actively involved in recruiting and interviewing for your backfill. So what, what is that, what is that experience like for you? Well, you know, I think, um, the self-awareness uh, for me is that knowing like the next stage the company is going through, um, the, the reopening, the return of live events, like bringing the world back together through live events. Um, you know, my instinct is like, we gotta get someone 10 X better than me for this mission. And, um, I kind of approach it that way, which is like, let's shoot for the moon. Like, let's just get like the, the absolute best. Um, and you know, at the same time, the work continues. So, um, some of the people that Julia mentioned are like doing some of the most innovative work, you know, in my time here, it's happening right now. So the hybrid working experiments, some of my team are working on this thing. They did the ship, this experiment called async week and course sync hours and, and a whole bunch of yet to come that are going to be a nice little surprise. Um, and that's exciting. It's like the work doesn't slow down. The work just, you know, is, is going on amidst this. Um, at the same time, it's a little bit fun. I get to I get to see some of these names and like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Go after that person. And I'm a little behind the scenes. So, you know, like if, if someone wants to chat with me, I'm there. But I'm kind of let's let Julia and, and the, the candidate form their own opinion. Um, so it's strange. I don't I would have never thought of, you know, be part of like, you know, kind of a, a circumstance like this. But I feel really good about it. And Julie, I want to come back to you just to talk a little bit about you. You've mentioned 
Um, obviously, the, the live event space, um, all business has been hit hard by COVID, especially in the early days, but none quite like live events and hospitality and just some of those uh, industries that just, you know, just were just taken out while as people had to shelter and stay home. And so uh, obviously you, you've, you co-founded the company, you've been there for years. What was that experience like just as, as a leader and as a person to have to kind of take this organization, this company that you had, had worked, you know, at that point, 13 years kind of building, uh, and then have to, you know, drastically kind of pivot the organization. Uh, I believe at the time you went through about a 50% reduction in staff. Uh, what was, what was that experience like for you as a leader? Well, I think it was, it was one that was incredibly clarifying. Um, you know, I, I remember the early days of the COVID crisis quite clearly. There was like it, like anything that maybe causes, um, indelible memories, i.e. trauma. It's like these flashes, you know, of of moments. And um, the first flash is uh, a text from our CFO at 5.30 a.m. Um, saying it's here, you know, and, and I quickly like went to our dashboards to look at, at the previous day's results and saw that we were undoubtedly hit by COVID and by hit, hit by the disruption of demand for live events, the hesitation of, should I buy that ticket? Um, and then the, the second uh, flash moment I remember is uh, I started calling everyone. And it's amazing how many people will pick up when, when they know that you are truly the tip of the spear and in the, in the eye of the storm. So I talked to you know many, many different CEOs um, and had the privilege of of talking to a lot of really smart people. And one of them, particularly Bob Mylod, was the CFO of booking during 9-11. And he said something to the effect of, you know, buckle up, you're about to process more refunds than revenue. And I was, you know, that kind of stuck with me for a minute. And then two days later, it happened. So we were literally generating negative revenue in the month of March of 2020. And so the the experience was one where it was so drastic and so fast that it didn't allow for any gray space to, um, you know, for us to live in and maybe convince ourselves that this wasn't going to be completely disruptive. And in a way that helped the executive team, you know, just flip into instant and urgent action. Um, but we were able to have and carve out a space for ourselves to first ask, you know, what would we do if we could do it all over again? Which was, I think, the unlock to um, the type of, of otherwise restrictive thinking that you'd have during your crisis where you want to shrink and command and control and get very restrictive in your thinking. It actually allowed us to be expansive. And the reason why it was important that we did that was because, and I'll, I never forget the day we did that. Um, I know the date. Uh, we was because we needed to too quickly change the size of the company in order to survive. There was no way that we'd be able to survive with you know, negative revenue, obviously. I mean, I hope that's an obvious. Um, but I didn't want to do it just because we needed to cut cost. I wanted us to contemplate the strategy that we would have accelerated if we could, right? T kind of trying to change a bad thing into a good thing and think about the opportunities. And so by June of 2020, we had you know, executed what was this really difficult and very early on in the COVID cycle layoff of 45% of our colleagues. So, so, you know, many, many Brightlings who do we'd worked for many years and we announced our layoff on April 8th. And the reason why that was so important to get not only that right, and so much went into getting that right and doing that in a way that was us, you know, and not, not somebody else's playbook, but it was human and it was in line with our values but also the sense of urgency was that we had a we had a real anxiety about the whole bottom falling out and beyond just travel and experiences and live events that all companies would be laying off and you know we thought pragmatically we want our people to get back out into the job market before anyone else and so um i i 
it's strange to say I'm proud of it, but I'm really proud of the way that we moved, the sense of urgency ha we had, and the depth of work. Because even though we were moving fast, we made sure to show up as humans. And that was, that was really David. I mean, there was no, the, I can't imagine anyone else being able to execute to that level of depth. Um, so come June, we're rebuilding and focused on a simplified, very um, kind of core to who we are strategy. Uh, and, and so it was kind of weird because everybody was just starting to go through it then. So we were sort of in this, in this like strange detached reality for a bit um, as, as other things started to unfold throughout 2020. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, and I, I hearing you kind of the way that you think about um, timing the, I mean, layoffs are hard. They're always hard, but, but timing it the way you did so that, the people who were impacted would actually hit the market before other organizations also hit their cycles. Um, that's really interesting to, you know, to hear and to kind of just understand the level of thought that went into the timing um, of that. And, you know, David, as a chief people officer, like you're, you're architecting that you're on absolutely the front lines of, of those types of business decisions, but also the other side of those business decisions. And even the chief people officers absolutely don't, own culture, um, you know, you, you influence culture, your, your teams are on the front lines of taking the calls from employees and, and, you know, navigating severance and, you know, the survivor's guilt that some people have that who weren't impacted, who stayed. So how did you like during those days, uh, in, in the kind of, in the immediate aftermath of, of that layoff, like how did you navigate those waters? Well, this was my face that you see now, but in, in, in my mind, I was going, holy shit, oh my God, holy shit, probably uh, multiple times throughout the day. Um, I mean, I was terrified. I, you know, I was terrified of what was going on in the world and I didn't know what this meant. So, you know, if I was, if I, if I looked calm and composed, like I certainly didn't feel that um, internally, but I think the, the sort of centering, um, the centering aspect for being at Eventbrite at that time and, and the role that I had to be in. Um, was, you know, uh, leading with this sort of humanity and leading with the human side in our approach. You know, as we're thinking about this, we kept going back to, you know, how are we going to take care of people? And so, you know, we, we just pushed ourselves on, on the cash cushion, on like the healthcare for as long as like really long time, letting people keep their laptops, you know, which wound up being like really important. So we were finding all these things and they were, we kept piling them on. Um, you know, and then, hey, we're going to have some people that can help them find their jobs. Let's help our Let's help them. Our own TA team is going to help people find jobs. And um, I was doing that too. I was spending the next, the immediate few days afterwards, helping people who were impacted on my team find jobs, putting in references, getting on the phone for them. Um, the really, I think the really interesting period um, after this was the change management afterwards. So people who are staying, and what is the story I'm going to buy into? That, that like difficult change management where I think, you know, the morale is plummeting and like that summer of 2020 was just like, how do you lead through that? How do you lead as a CEO? How do you lead as a, as a chief HR officer? Um, that were, that's where we were like, I think truly even tested more. Um, having to start, restart the story. We're going to rebuild this company from the studs. We were hiring a CTO. Um, and, and a few months later after that, as it sort of dust started to settle, like we need to build a technical organization, product and, and technology organization that is going to lead the charge on this new business model that, that we're going to really lean on to emerge stronger from this. And so getting people bought in, um, getting the strategy right, you know, the three-year strategy, crafting that, getting the communications right, that was where it was even, you were tested even more and continue to be tested on your humanity. I remember a moment where I had to share with people, like, what is the morale of the company right now in that summer of 2020? And I'm like, here it is. It's not great. I'm just going to put it out there. And I think there was this like a moment of trust that started to click between the people who were staying and like the story we started to tell. You started to see something tick back up. And now years later, you know, our like engagement has completely rebounded. Like we're plus 20 points from that summer of, of 2020. But that change management period, um, I think, was, was even harder um, and, and really hard for the, for the collective leadership team. But now we're like, like we so like found our footing that um, I feel um, I feel a, a sense of like just um, you know honor and pride to have been part of that and like help the team sort of through that and emerge in like this really strong position. 
David, do you mind sharing the story about when you, the dust had settled, we were sort of out of the survival mode, and we were having a one-on-one, -on -one and, and you described what your working situation was at home with two little kids and what happened after that? I, I just, I, hearkening back to that, I think it's such a great story. Yeah, I, you know, um, so the schools, schools were out. Um, my wife and I were both working full-time jobs. Um, uh, the kids were sick. Um, there was like, there was no, there was, we didn't have um, anyone to help us. Um, and at this time, I think even, um, if you had, if you were lucky to have, um, you know, someone like a nanny, uh, there was even still some rules around like whether they could actually come over or not. It was just a really dark time. And I, I remember this moment, like where I'm being asked, you know, to kind of like step into these different things and put on a brave face. And like, I'm like, Julia, I gotta be honest with you right now. Like I got one kid who's crying upstairs. I got another kid who I think just pooped on the floor. Um, I have, um, a, a wife who's like, is, is, you know, kind of like a mess in the other room and like, I don't even know I'm going to get through like the next meeting. And, and, and if I'm in that position with someone like the C in the title, imagine like all the parents at the company and like what they're going through and how do they get through this? Like, how do we, how do we be there for them? We were fortunate to be able, you know, as, as a, I think, um, as a company to offer a lot of flexibility to give people the time back, to take the time that you need to take care of yourself and like take care of yourself first. Like Julie, there was a moment there, I think where Julie's like, Hey, if you're in this, we got to get this message out to everyone else. If you're feeling this as well, imagine every parent, you know, in the company right now who, um, you know, is doing this and, and, and has even less resources. Let's go help them. And you wrote this, this note to the company. It was one of the most powerful notes. It, it really unlocked something of, you know, dialogue and trust and camaraderie. And it was, it was one of the most significant cultural moments of the last few years was David laying bare, you know, get, being pretty vulnerable with the company about what his day-to-day -day was looking like behind the scenes. And it really shifted the conversation for us into that next gear of what do we need to do to get through this moment together? And however long it is, we're going to keep evolving and iterating and figuring it out. And, um, and that was just, that was a, I think that was like a crucible moment for, for the rebuilding of trust and camaraderie at the company. Yeah. There's, there's this power of vulnerability to build trust and like people want to they want to hear it. Like I can relate to you as, as a human, as a leader, when you're sharing a little bit about, about yourself, my mom had passed away right before the pandemic started. So February, 2020, um, I had, you know, ongoing family um, health issues throughout. Um, you know, I've got, a, I've got a dad who I'm trying to take care of who's, who's got his own health issues. And like, um, you know, when, when, when a leader is comfortable sharing a little bit about, Hey, here's what's going on with me. It changes the relationship. It changes the relationship where how people see you, like, do I trust you or not? Or like, hey, you're just this like, you know, you're, you're just kind of this person in the ivory tower. Um, and you, without really thinking about it, when I did those things, it did change relationship to Julia's point. It was just a powerful reminder of, of like vulnerability and trust. Yeah, I mean, I think that's been so important. And for, for many leaders and organizations, the, the walls have come down, right? I think that the, there, there is a certain kind of persona of people in you know, with a C in their title of being infallible and, and inflappable and like they're not, they're human and they're going through the same things. And when you're able to share that openly and like being, being comfortable, being open and vulnerable is an individual choice, right? Like there's lots of conversations around vulnerable. Not everybody's going to be comfortable doing that. That's okay. But if you are, and you, when you share that and you can connect with your employees in that way, it just, the, it, it's so quickly, uh, kind of removes any hierarchy within the organization and allows people to realize that we're all humans experiencing this once in a generation, hopefully, event together. Um, and it sucks and it's hard. Um, last question I want to ask, actually, get both your perspectives on before we move the lightning round. You know, we're we're in this. You know, Julia, you mentioned the conversation you had around the the four day work week that that wasn't, and uh, you know, the the Friday, the, you know, bright days. There's so much that's happening right now as we're really, you know, designing a new world of work and what that looks like. And I'd love to get both your perspectives, you know, Julia, starting with you. When you think about this opportunity we have to create new constructs of work, whether it's hybrid, uh, there's so many different, you know, variables to this. 
What gets you most excited? Well, I think that we're in an incredible moment, a, a really unique and a once in a lifetime moment to reflect on how we want to take advantage of a globally distributed workforce to, you know, be able to go find the talent out of seven and a half billion people wherever they are in the world and to truly be able to elevate those who didn't in the past pre-COVID have access to the opportunities they have now. When I'm in our new Breitling orientation, um, I get to meet all the new Breitlings on their first day and introduce myself. The classes that are coming through now, the cohorts of new Breitlings are just getting more and more diverse from a from an experience standpoint, diverse from a background standpoint, and certainly none of them are in the cities where we used to recruit. And and predominantly in the United States, that's that shift has been remarkable. And what I think is really cool about that is that we're never going back. So we don't actually have, in my mind, everybody's got an opinion about this, but we don't really have the option, like practically for Eventbrite, we're not going back to just seven hubs where we only recruit within a distance, of, uh, an acceptable um, commute distance from that office. Uh, so what's exciting about that is we don't get to fall back on old habits that didn't, didn't serve us well. I think all of us are in pursuit of you know, serving our mission that matters, which is bringing the world together through live experiences in the most connected and productive way possible. And I think the commonality that is thread through this problem set is that we all want to do our best work. We all want to make lifelong friendships. We all want to work for the best leaders of our career. And I think the unlock is, is still in the creation phase. So it's pretty cool because you don't have, uh, you know, Stephen Covey book to read to like figure out how to, you know, how to how to do this. Or Laszlo Block hasn't like determined how we're all going to work. Uh, and you just implement that. Um, I think it's pretty cool that that ideas are still forming and there's iteration and experimentation. So I think that like uh, I think that on the other hand, when I walk around this space that we used to call an office that, you know, is now a gathering place, it feels pretty irrelevant the way it's it's set up in terms of it being um, uh, the right type of space or the right way in which we use it. So it's sort of this artifact of the past and it's kind of kind of makes me laugh because it's just not it's just not what we need. But I don't know exactly what we need and it's not just completely up to me. I think what we've done a pretty good job of is we've given we've given Breitlings a sense of what our overarching philosophy is, which is, you know, we should we should be able to enter the future with a with a, a system that works for us and that yields the greatest productivity and the greatest connection and the greatest oper the the greatest platform for learning. Um, but we're really open about getting input and 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 testing and learning together. Um, and so I think there's an empowerment in that. But I also think that, you know, we're not going to be doing this forever. We don't we don't tend, you know, we're not thinking like, OK, we'll, we'll be in this testing and learning curve for the next five years. However, I think it's really important to point out that we're not through this. We're not we're not through the pandemic completely. We're not through as much as I, I wanted to be in the rearview mirror as much as you do. We're still experiencing the trauma of uncertainty, you know, and and I think that um, we can't be so quick to sort of want to predict the exact dimensions and, you know, exact pantone of what that future is going to be. And we have to be OK with living in this ambiguous uncertainty. And and I think there's something pretty beautiful in that. I get really excited about it. Sorry. <laughs> No, I can tell. And I, and I love it. And I think, you know, having that that openness to what will be that is going to be based on a reality that we don't quite know what it is yet. I think that's so important to acknowledge because companies, uh, you know, you're seeing them every day. Companies are making their announcements around return to workplace plans and, you know, they're they're kind of filling up. It's time to move back in. But we don't really know what the future holds. We don't we don't know if Megatron variant is around the corner and that's going to, you know, force us all back. We, do, we just don't know. And so having that that openness 
to, you know, kind of adapt to the moments as they are and then readapt based on different circumstances, I think is really important. Um, you know, David, from your perspective, like what gets you excited? You know, Julia, I'm kind of was nodding my head as, as she was talking about it. I see a lot of that same uh, same opportunity. Um, I was thinking of uh, Doc McFly from uh, Back to the Future Roads, where we're going, we won't need roads. And, um, we, you know, the, the future is, is TBD. Um, and it's really not about a binary choice of like, are we building an office culture, you know, now going forward? Are we building a remote culture? Um, it, I think people teams get this sort of like, you know, this like, com- like mistaken belief that it's like you're choosing someplace in between in terms of how you're building culture. And there's so much more to it in terms of opportunity. We have creators and consumers, you know, our, our culture is happening where they are. You know, we have communities that we're operating in. We don't have an office where I'm at in Austin. we got about 15 people, um, but we have a community here. We have got a community engagement time off program. Like we can volunteer in the community. We can reconnect with our community. We can foster a connection, um, connection to the company, connection to the mission, connection to each other, you know, without having to think about this binary choice. Like, are we doing this over Zoom or are we doing this over the office? And sort of reimagining that and thinking thinking outside of that that sort of that, you know, kind of that tight box, if you will, is exciting for, for people teams, you know, to, to work with leaders to do that, um, to experiment. And um, and I think getting the balance right between choice. So we believe that like the more that we give choice to employees, we empower them. And, and if we trust them, they're going to do their work the best. They know best. So let's give them the choice. We're going to give them the choice where they work. We're going to give them the choice if they want to come in the office or not. At the same time, we know that employees at, at all levels actually want a little bit of structure. I want a little bit of like, you know, hey, what's my... What's the playing field here at, at Eventbrite? So I know I want to hit out of the park. I just need to know a little bit of the rules of the playing field. So getting that right is also an, an art um, that we haven't perfected yet in, in, in this future that we're heading towards. And so um, that's fun. That's exciting. You know, if I'm, a, if I'm in a people team, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get jazzed about that. Yeah. I mean, look, I think you're, you're both spot on and I agree with all of it. Um, and this has been a really fun conversation. Uh, I really learned, in, enjoyed learning more about kind of uh, a, what Eventbrite has been through, but B, kind of have the two of you work together to navigate the organization through it. Um, we wrap up every podcast with a lightning round to help the audience get to know you both a little bit better. So uh, we're going to jump right into that. Um, we kick things off with music. Uh, and Julia, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, I'm checking out your Spotify playlist. Who will I learn your top three artists? Uh, this, this was hard to, I'm um, horrible at lightning rounds. All right. Stevie uh, Nicks. <laughs> Uh, Krungbin, which is actually a Texas band, and Lumineers. Ah, okay. Uh, David, how about I've you? I've never heard of Krungbin. Um, okay, so so me, um, the three bands are Operators, Thursday, and Appleseed Cast. Wow. I've never heard of all me. three of those, so <laughs> I just... You know, this, this question is fantastic music discovery for everybody. I know so we just I think share, all of us are gonna be, our, you know, our playlist <laughs> with each other. Love it. Um, okay, David, I'm coming to you first on this one. Um, describe Julia in three words. Julia is caring, funny, and calm. Okay, Julia, your turn. I thought of bottomless pit of optimism. <laughs> You're cheating a little bit there, but I'm, I'm going I'm to let that one slide. <laughs> Irreverent. And brilliant. All right. Um, we're switching from music to TV. Uh, David, what was your latest binge? Um, this is going to a dark place here, um, but I uh, was um, glued to Narcos Mexico, which is kind of like a, a mm. gangster show. I loved it. <laughs> well, I've not seen Mexico yet, but the first one was amazing. Dark. Um, yeah. I actually have just started re-watching the TV shows that I worked on when I was in television development. So that is a total trip. So Jackass, yeah. uh, Nip Tuck, which was one of Ryan Murphy's earlier, earlier shows, and The Shield and Rescue Me. So that's sort of like what I have teed up as my, as my binge, and it's pretty fun to watch some of them with my kids. So with the, there's like a very small slice that's appropriate. Um, and I, I also <laughs> just loved the Janet Jackson documentary series. I highly recommend it. Yeah. 
Well, you've got a lot. Of, uh, that's a large catalog to pull that's from. That's quite a spectrum. That's going to keep you busy. Jack yeah, that is, to Jack it really Jackson. is. <laughs> um, what advice, Julie, I'm going to come back to you on this one first. Um, what advice do you have for your next chief people officer? Oh my gosh. I, you know, I've really learned, especially with David, uh, to let your chief people officer wave their freak flag high and just, you know, give them space to be in, to be in process, to be in creation, to be imperfect, to, um, you know, I, I really think that like, uh, the idea or the construct that a chief people officer should always have the right answer when it comes to, to people. I think, I think we threw that out the window during this crisis, but I would very much like to impart that on, on the next chief people officer. And then for the person that, that, you know, or the team that David works with in the future, in whatever realm he decides to work in, I would say the same thing. Let him wave his freak flag high. It's, it's like really important to appreciate um, you know, the out of the box thinking that people bring to any problem. And, uh, David, how about you? So um, I'm thinking of a um, term that uh, Julia used to describe something that we did. Um, and, uh, the meta concept is, you know, be bold. And Julia said, wow, you really honey badgered that thing. Um, which is, <laughs> you know, like, kind of, you know, kind of like made it happen, um, in a way that could have been a little bit risky, um, but you know, that's, that, I think that's the mode that we're in, um, at Eventbrite and, um, do that, be bold and, and honey badger it. Yeah. Well, last question for both of you, uh, Julia, I'm going to start with you. What is one thing you'll miss the most about working with David? Oh my God. I mean, that you're going to make me cry now. Uh, well, <laughs> his heart, I mean, it's just, it's, it's so unique to work with someone who, uh, has this this heart that just keeps moving, growing, and pointed in the in the right direction. Um, I'm mixing my metaphors, but you know, really caring as much about this company as I do. And I thought that was not humanly possible because you know I helped birth the company. But David cares. He has a total founder mindset. Yeah. And uh, David, I would I would echo that just knowing you um, and curious to get your perspective. What, what will you miss most about working with well, Julia? I've, I've said this to anyone who will listen about Julia is, is the best CEO I've ever worked with, um, bar none. And I, I would going to miss Julia's really authentic human self and getting to work with a leader who I think is the embodiment of, of what a lot of CPOs really strive for in their career, which is like work with a human CEO, someone who's an authentic human um, and who really gets the hard work of people work. Um, and like one, one little thing I'll tell you about another thing I'm going to miss is, um, I would, in our one-on-ones, I would put an agenda together for our one-on-ones. Like I have, I perfectly sort of ordered agenda, like, Hey, let's get through all this stuff. And my best one-on-ones with Julia have been, we're going to throw the agenda out, but we're just going to talk. How are you doing? How am I doing? Like, what is going on in the world right now? And I'm going to miss those moments. Like where we just kind of throw the agenda aside and we just like, we just catch up. Um, so and that's part of who But we is. get to always do that, you know, when true. we're not working together, then we true. don't, yeah, we don't no have an agenda required. at all. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Fair point. Yeah, you're moving on to like a no agenda by yeah. default now. That's, yeah, uh, that's we're amazing. Winning. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, Julia, David, I really appreciate you both coming on the podcast. I'm excited that this is the first CEO, CPO kind of joint uh, episode, and I'm just grateful for your candor. Uh, thanks so much for making time for this and sharing your story, sharing how you work together. Thanks yeah, so thanks, Lars. Thanks, David. Thank you.